Hello everyone, in this video we're going to derive the rocket equation, which is an equation that tells you how much of a speed boost a rocket will get after it's burnt a certain amount of fuel. We'll also consider the effect that external forces such as gravity will have on uh, the size of that speed boost. So the basic setup of this problem is illustrated in this diagram here, where down at the bottom left we have our rocket in what I've called state 1, where it has a total mass of m. Um, and is moving straight upwards with a velocity of v, then some infinitesimally short time later uh, the rocket is in state 2, where it's moved a little bit up, but it's also changed both its mass and its velocity. Now the reason both of those quantities are changing is because the rocket is burning fuel. As it burns fuel, the fuel turns into exhaust gases, they're fired out, the, out of the engine, um, that's going to cause some acceleration and hence a change in velocity, but it's also going to reduce the overall mass of the rocket. And in fact, for actual rockets, the mass of the fuel makes up a very significant fraction of the, the total initial mass of the rocket, which is what complicates this analysis, right? We can't just apply an equation like force equals mass times acceleration because the mass itself is varying by uh, quite a large amount. There are a few other useful things we can add to our diagram. In particular, this little black dot that I've drawn here being fired out the back of the rocket represents an infinitesimal portion of the exhaust gases. Now those gases are just being produced by a chemical reaction, which is the oxidation of the fuel within the rocket. And in chemical reactions, you don't lose or gain any mass because you don't lose or gain any atoms. Um, so the conclusion is then, well, we had a, an initial mass of M, and that mass included both the body of the rocket and however much fuel happened to be in the rocket at that first instant. Uh, we've now changed the mass within the rocket itself to M plus dm, but our system has to still have a total mass of M. So the mass of our little gas element has to be minus dm. Now try not to be put off by that minus sign. It doesn't mean that the mass of the gas is actually negative. The reason it's there comes down to the fact that we wrote the new mass of the rocket itself as m plus dm. We know, of course, that the rocket is burning fuel and therefore decreasing in mass over time. What that tells us is that dm itself has to be a negative quantity, right? So that m is actually getting smaller over time. So minus dm is a positive quantity. If you're wondering why we didn't just write m minus dm in the first instance, because we know it's decreasing, that's basically because by convention d of something means the signed infinitesimal change in that quantity. So it's fine for it to be either positive or negative, and in fact later on we're going to end up uh, integrating up our infinitesimal um, equations, and if we'd put a minus sign there we'd run into some problems with the integration. We're also going to assume that the gas is being ejected at a constant velocity relative to the rocket itself, and I'm going to call that constant velocity w, but remember, I've just said that it's constant relative to the rocket, and therefore, because we're doing this analysis um, from the perspective of some observer, for example, standing on Earth, we have to convert that W into the observer's frame, and we do that by subtracting the velocity of the rocket itself, um, which is just V. You could write that as V plus dV if you wanted to be very uh, precise, but for reasons that we'll go into a little bit later, it's not going to make any difference. Finally, let's also allow for some generic external force to act on the system um, in the direction of motion of the rocket. So I'm going to draw a little upwards arrow, different type of arrow to distinguish it from the velocity, um, and let's call that F for the total external force. So the way we're going to derive our rocket equation is by considering the total momentum of the system. Now straightforwardly, um, the total momentum of the system in phase one of the motion down at the bottom is just mv. Now note that the momentum isn't conserved because of the presence of that external force. So what the external force does is increase the momentum by some amount equal to the impulse of the force. And because, um, well, force is the rate of change of momentum, we can write that little incremental bit of momentum due to the external force um, as f dt, um, where dt is the time interval between uh, phase one and phase two of the motion. Now f is not necessarily a constant, it can vary with time, so if we wanted we could put another arrow up here and say there's a force of f plus df, but if we had f plus df instead of just f here you would have a second order small term, right? You would have a f dt plus df dt and because we're considering infinitesimal quantities, we would neglect that second order term. So that's why I haven't bothered to draw in that f plus df, but just bear in mind that f can vary with time. So our original momentum has been increased by some impulse. We can then set that equal to the final momentum, which again, straightforwardly from diagram two, uh, the mass times velocity is just m plus dm v plus dv. Then we're going to have to subtract the momentum of the uh, the gas in the downwards direction, so we've got minus 
being careful with the signs, uh, your mass is minus dm and your velocity downwards is w minus v. Again, if we had put w minus v uh, minus another dv there, when we expand those brackets, we would have a dm dv term, which we would end up neglecting anyway, because it's second order. So let's see how we can tidy this up a little bit. Well, I'm going to just leave the left hand side as it is, but we can expand these double brackets on the right to get mv plus vdm plus mdv plus dm dv. And I'll just combine these two minus signs to write the last bit as plus w minus v dm. Notice that we've got another one of these second order um, infinitesimal quantities that we were talking about. So in the limit, when dm and dv become very small, we can neglect that term relative to the other one. So let's cross that out. Some other things cancel as well. So this mv cancels with that mv. Uh, we've also got a vdm, which will cancel with this minus vdm that you'd get if you expanded those brackets. So we're just left with a couple of terms, fdt on the left, which is equal to mdv plus wdm in the limit of small uh, quantities. It would also be nice to divide everything by m, so we get a nice dm over m term on the far right, so that we can integrate that fairly straightforwardly. So let's do that. Your left hand side is just going to be f over m dt. f and m, remember, both can depend on time. Uh, then you just got dv, and then you've got a plus uh, w dm over m. Now we're in a position where we can do some integration. So let's integrate everything, integrate both sides. Uh, w is a constant, remember, so we can put that in front of the integral. Um, in terms of the limits, well, let's just say the initial time is zero, um, and the time uh, at which we're interested in the final state of the rocket is just t. I can put my limits as zero and t there. Technically, I have to turn this dt into some other dummy variable. Let's call it dt prime. Um, your velocity limits, let's say we start the rocket with an initial velocity of v0. Uh, it has a final velocity of just v. And again, we've got to turn this v into a v prime. And similarly for m, right? So let's make our m's m primes and uh, say that the mass goes from m0 to just m. Now, the right-hand side is pretty straightforward to evaluate because the integral of dv prime uh, with those limits is going to be v minus v0. Integrating dm prime over m prime gives you a natural log term um, so this ends up being plus w uh, and then natural log of m minus natural log of m naught. The left hand side, uh, well, we can't really do much with unless we know specifically how f and m depend on time. So I'm just going to write that as an integral. I'll write it as the integral of lowercase f um, with respect to time. Um, where lowercase f I'm just defining as the force per unit mass and we kind of implicitly understand that there are limits of 0 and t. And so the quantity we're ultimately interested in is how much speed uh, the rocket gains. So we just put v on its own uh, and get v is v0 plus this uh, integral term, integral of force per unit mass with respect to time. Uh, we can combine the natural logs. Uh, remember, we're going to put those on the left hand side because we're getting v on its own. So you're going to have a log m0 minus log m, but then you can use your laws of logs to write that as plus w uh, log of m0 over m. So this equation is basically saying that your final velocity comes from starting with your initial velocity, adding on some term due to the impulse of the external force, and then adding on some other term, uh, which depends on how quickly the gas is being um, ejected and how much fuel you've burnt, right? m naught over m is always going to be a quantity um, which is bigger than 1 um, because the mass is always decreasing. m naught, this mass you start with, remember, so you'll always have less mass afterwards than you start with. And the natural log of something bigger than one uh, is a positive quantity. So that is always going to cause the velocity to increase. And of course, we expect intuitively. Now, if we had an expression for the external force as a function of time, then we could do this integral analytically. But most forces that we care about in practice are not just functions of time, right? For example, gravity depends on distance from the center of whatever planet you're, uh, you're launching from. And this is a time integral, not a distance integral. Um, and so that's not really something that we can do straightforwardly. Uh, it might be a drag force as well. Drag forces are velocity dependent. Um, that makes it impossible to do the integral as well. So in general, we just have to kind of leave that term as it is or evaluate it numerically. Um, but we could consider um, the case of uh, a constant gravitational field. So when you're near the surface of um, whatever planet you're on, um, that would mean that your F, which remember is applied force per unit mass, uh, would be just minus the gravitational field strength, minus because we defined f to be pointing upwards, um, and we're here assuming that this g is just a constant. 
then that would straightforwardly lead to v equals v naught um, plus, let's put our log term plus w log of m naught over m, um, and then minus g t because the limits of integration were just zero and t. Again, this is pretty intuitive because we've just gained an extra term um, saying that, well, the, the longer you take to burn the fuel, the more you subtract off your velocity because gravity has more of a chance to act and cause a downwards acceleration. Um, and so if you want to give your rocket the biggest speed boost possible, you need to burn the fuel um, over a short time scale, a time scale which is shorter than the time scale on which gravity tends to cause um, downwards acceleration. Um, and again, this is kind of intuitive. We would, we would expect that you, know, you don't want to gradually burn all your fuel. You'll still release the same amount of energy in total, um, but if you want a big boost of uh, momentum, a big boost of velocity, then you need to burn it very quickly uh, because of that final term there. So I think that's enough for this time. Next time we'll revisit the same equation um, and use it to understand quantitatively why rockets tend to be divided into multiple stages. So I hope to see you again soon to talk a little bit more about rockets.